Hello, everyone. I'm very happy that uh, you're joining our uh, conversation today through our climate talk. We are from Baku. We are in uh, COP29 Azerbaijan. For those who doesn't know what is COP, COP is Conference of Party, the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change. So COP is an annual meeting organized by uh, the UNFCCC, by the UN Accord that is in charge of climate change issues. And we meet uh, regularly once every year. Uh, last year it was in Dubai and the year before it was in uh, Egypt. And this year we are here in uh, Baku, Azerbaijan. Uh, it's a very exciting process because we uh, are having people coming in different parts of the world and uh, the people are here either as a civil society, as negotiators, uh, as the UN officers, but as well as representative of uh, indigenous people, uh, uh, youth, etc. So there are around 70,000 people, that, uh, the one that I read uh, recently. Uh, by the way, I am Budi, Budi Cahyono, the International uh, uh, Advocacy Director of Franciscan International. And I am accompanied by uh, Lo Hong's Black Mare from the Dominican First Assist and Peace and Igor Pastos from the Lauda to Sea Movement. They are here as civil society, so they are also following uh, pop like us, uh, Francis International, and they are here uh, with their own uh, agenda activities and uh, following different discussions and negotiations at uh, the COP. And as you can see that we are now in the compound of what we call as uh, exhibit, in which uh, NGOs having their own uh, exhibit uh, to uh, show their activities with regard to climate change. And next to us, there are uh, what they call as side event rooms, in which there are side events or small conferences organized by uh, NGOs, civil society, uh, movements, etc. And they are still uh, doing some activities inside. But however, without further ado, I would like to ask you, Lohongs, uh, uh, Lohongs Lattler, uh, to ask you regarding the fact that you are here, in fact, not alone. You are also with two uh, persons from the Philippines. You are trying to bring people from the grassroots to come to uh, uh, COP. So what is the objective of bringing people from the grassroots uh, to attend COP29? Yes, uh, thank you, Woody. So uh, very glad to be uh, with you all uh, today. Um, yes, indeed, uh, I came here not alone with two uh, young women from the Philippines, one student, actually, in environmental planning and one uh, teacher in science. Um, so really, uh, I think uh, as faith-based organization, um, uh, I think one of the value of our participation is to have the connection with the, the people from a uh, grassroots level. Um, so we uh, are in touch with uh, different uh, local communities around the world. And this year, we really wanted to uh, showcase the, our project in the Philippines, which is about um, educating the young people on climate change and human rights. As we know, climate change is a reality and it affects all rights, right to education in particular in the Philippines. And our student has actually spoke about this issue uh, in a side event yesterday in the Faith Pavilion on how climate change is impacting uh, in the long term um, the, the knowledge of the, the, the children in the Philippines and uh, it is it, it cannot be quantified. So it's, a, it's really it's a non-economic loss. loss. <laughs> yes. yeah, so um, uh, the, 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 the idea is really to, uh, to bring people from the ground because sometimes the negotiations are quite or can be quite disconnected from uh, the experience of the people. And I think it's really one of the positive thing about faith based organization is that they have this connection with uh, local based initiatives and they can bring that into the negotiation. You're talking about negotiations. That's very interesting because honestly here there are uh, different type of negotiations. There are so many subjects to cover. There are so many technical, uh, very uh, nitty gritty discussions uh, that Sometimes we are lost, sometimes we don't understand. We cannot pretend to understand the, the, the every single discussions and negotiations in COP. So it is it can be very overwhelming, but at the same time, we understand that it's very important for us to, at least to attend, to understand, and when possible to, uh, to participate in those discussions and negotiations. So, Lohongs, maybe I can ask uh, continue uh, 
with you because you mentioned about negotiations. Is there any negotiations that you uh, attended today or mm. yesterday? And maybe you can share a little bit on your experience in observing yes. uh, the negotiation. So um, it's um, it's I have to admit it's been a bit complicated for us to try to enter meetings. Um, really? uh, yes. Uh, so they, so to understand the UNFCCC agenda is already something. And it keeps moving and changing uh, the places and the time. So uh, that's our first challenge. Um, so for the newbies of the COP, I don't know how they manage to navigate uh, this uh, huge jungle of, of meetings uh, that are sometimes open and sometimes not open to observers. But yesterday, we could attend uh, a negotiation on uh, the long-term climate finance. And um, we could definitely understand the dynamics of the states uh, between developing states and developed states on climate finance. So that was... <laughs> what is the difference between well, the yeah. negotiation? How was it? Uh, it, was, um, it was not even a debate. I mean, the developing states had their own stance and the developed states had their own you know, interpretation of the whole issue. So basically, uh, the developed states um, were basically saying that um, in terms of the, the goal to uh, to uh, address uh, adaptation and mitigation, they had to put on the table uh, a certain amount of money. It was decided in 2009 to put... Uh, 2009, yeah. Yes, uh, to put uh, an amount of $100 billion, I think. One hundred, yeah. Yes, uh, which was only achieved in 2022. The developed states yesterday kept saying that um, they managed to uh, pay this amount uh, and they even exceeded it. Um, whereas the developing states kept saying that, okay, fine, uh, but um, there's no transparency. Where does this money come from? And actually, most of the money that were uh, provided uh, were uh, as uh, loans instead loans. of grants, which doesn't help much the developing states. So there was not really a discussion. Like, you know, uh, both sides had their own views. And so today I wanted to go back uh, in the room. And uh, I was just there about an hour ago. We sit in the room, which was an overflow room because the room had changed and nothing happened. I mean, there was not even a connection to the real negotiation. I couldn't, I couldn't follow the negotiation. So I don't know what happened. Uh, but overall, um, I got some insights from other people um, who informed us that, um, I don't know what you think, vote, but the overall feeling is that uh, the negotiations in every... Uh, topics are not moving so fast. There's a lot of procedural um, challenges, and uh, 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 many times the, the sessions are delayed or yes, uh, or cancelled. So we'll have to see what happens. Yeah. But I have some interesting uh, insights from climate finance that I was able to look uh, online. Yeah, yeah, I'll get back to you again after because it's really interesting. You see, uh, uh, climate finance is like uh, the theme of the uh, COP29. So COP29 is often considered as uh, uh, climate uh, no, finance COP because there is uh, the need to boost up uh, the numbers of commitment uh, in addressing climate change. But as you mentioned, that it's not yet there. We are still in, uh, far away from that. And now we have Igor, Igor uh, Bastos. Uh, from Laudato Si, uh, Laudato si uh, movement. Uh, Laudato Si, as you all know, you're Franciscans. Uh, Laudato Si has been uh, very much inspiring for us. So I would like to see, uh, as a Laudato Si movement, as someone coming from Laudato Si, what is your uh, uh, engagement or what is your message or what is what, what do you bring to here? Yeah, thank you, Bubi. Thank you, guys. Five thousand for Franciscans. So nice to be here. So nice to be here with you, Bubi, again. Yes. I think it's our third third talk together. together. Yes, yeah. And it's so nice to be with you as well. <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, on my side. Uh, ah, good to see you. Welcome. Oh. <laughs> How so, are you? Yes, yes, Ryan. How are you? Are you now, right? Yes, of course. We met in yes, the hotel. Yes, 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 yes. Our colleague from the hotel is here. <laughs> so, from Good our job. side, uh, I would say, first of all, it's so nice to see members and people from the Catholic Church, not just from the Catholic Church, from other faith based yes. Uh, yes. Uh, organizations. Helena joined us here, so, so uh, we are here. So. Other friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it is so nice to see members of the Catholic family 
uh, here. So I just left a meeting with the the policy, the policy, yes, and uh, the delegation from the policy, and uh, based also in the speech yesterday uh, mm -hmm. from the policy, talking about more integral approach of the climate issues, uh, and it was a kind of a strong message from from presses. Uh, I would say. Okay. Uh, it, it would be interesting, it would be better also to address some key topics that have been, have been discussing. Yeah. Uh, uh, but in a general approach, I would say that it's a more integral approach between the economic law and, and debt, for example, and the poor countries and this uh, inequality between the countries in the south, uh, in the north and the south. So for me, it's also uh, Beautiful to see this this commitment as well. So as Ella saying, and I'm here uh, from Brazil because we are trying to build some bridges between COP29 and COP30. So there are more organizations and more people from Brazil, as you may know, some of you, Brian Rodrigo is yeah. also here, he's from Brazil. I, I also met some guys from Caritas uh, Brazil as well. So our main objective, because as you already mentioned, it's not easy to cover everything. We, there are many events and discussions at the same time. So our main focus here as Lot of the Sea Movement is to build these bridges between uh, COP29 and COP30. So we expect that COP30 will be a massive COP. Mm -hmm. I mean, people and, and other uh, movements uh, uh, from different perspectives, they, they will be there together. So I expect that this in this COP, uh, we can accomplish our mission as LSM to build these bridges and make sure that we understand COPs as process and not just as events. And yesterday there was also a meeting between the civil society from Brazil with the vice president. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit of, on that? What, what was the, the, the meeting about and how did you find the meeting? Yeah, that was a, a, an interesting meeting because uh, that was a kind of the first public announcement of the new NDCs uh, from Brazil. Okay. Oh, okay. No? Yeah. okay. So the, the, I think that if I'm not what wrong, is NDCs? Is uh, now <laughs> you can help in English. <laughs> NDC I... is not a nationally determined contribution. So NDCs, right. uh, each country has to issue uh, a kind of commitment on how they will address uh, the climate change, and this commitment normally is renewed every five years. So the first uh, NDCs was uh, in 2015 during the Paris Agreement, uh, Paris uh, COP, and then uh, it has been renewed. Uh, once, twice, and the next one is going to be uh, to next year. So you mentioned that although uh, the commitment to keep NDCs till next year, so Brazil government, Brazilian government has issued the NDCs uh, uh, during this COP. Yeah, so that's very interesting. I think the deadline uh, was on February yes, next exactly. year, yes. but uh, the 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 objective of the Brazilian government was to try to push other states and governments having a more ambitious uh, NDCs. So from the Brazilian perspective and uh, from the civil society organizations, there that's a little bit controversial and it is because from the from the civil society side, uh, there is a, a, a perspective that we could be more ambitious as yeah. a country. Yeah. But on another hand, when we compare the country with other countries, it's very likely, and that's a that, that's the the message from the vice president of Brazil, Gerald Alckmin. He said that it's it's very likely that the the Brazilian embassies are more ambitious than the most than any other yeah. countries. Yeah. So that's the controversial perspective. Okay, that's very interesting. If I may, on this, yeah. I learned today that the Prime Minister of UK has announced uh, also new NDCs, and the target is to reduce uh, of 81 percent the emission uh, ah, for 2035. Okay. It's, yeah, yes. Yeah, so it's very ambitious. Yeah. Now, civil society is saying, let's see if uh, the, these pledges will, you know, be real action. So thank you now. Now, yes, of course. So this is we we are with Elena. Elena is uh, from the Lutheran World Federation. She just finished also the webinar with the uh, network of the Lutheran who participates online uh, for the COP. So go ahead, Elena. Yeah, just to to mention on the NDCs because yes, uh, we just ended uh, the meeting at what you said. So 
um, our uh, policy advisor said that uh, the, if we, if we uh, sum all the NDCs and the commitments, we only reduce 20, uh, 20, uh, 26% of the total emission that we need to use. Mm -hmm. And the target was 50%. So uh, still the NDCs are not too ambitious. No. Uh, so the best scenario is only giving 28 instead of 50%. Instead of 50%. That's why. So we, as a faith-based organization, need to push because uh, to, to governments to be more ambitious, they will submit the new NDCs, most of them in February or maybe very close to the COP. So it's time, there's time to do yeah. a focus yeah. you know, at the yeah. national level. Maybe on this, I was reading a report that was just published uh, these days by uh, Climate Action Tracker, and they said that the current policies from the NDCs uh, would lead us to a 2.7 uh, degrees of warming. So this is uh, above, above, above 1.5 degrees as mandated by uh, Paris Agreement. Yeah. No? And this was also uh, the same figure who was in the last report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is no... Many yeah, yeah. So that uh, coming to that, it's sometimes we talk about the false solutions, no? We discuss a lot about false solutions. Rodrigo, Rodrigo Perez. I think many of you know him very well. He is one of the most senior, uh, let's say, uh, uh, activists among us uh, regarding the environmental issue, climate change, etc. You've been participating in many COP. And yesterday, when you spoke in the Fed Pavilion, it was very uh, uh, inspiring for many because you talk about. Uh, you know, the fact that some of the proposed uh, solutions are false solutions, especially when we talk about the critical minerals, green transitions or green energy, etc. What is your comment on that? And how do you see that issue is being addressed uh, in COP29 now here? Yeah. I think in general, not COP29, but in general, the COPs took uh, a point of view that uh, some issues are out. Especially when we talk about from the perspective of the communities, mm. you know, and and from the people who are suffering the the this extreme uh, weather events or or other impacts, we we're looking for 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 the perspective of financing the crisis, how we, we can save uh, the the impact. For, be saved from the impacts, but we didn't discuss which society we want, which kind of economy we, we, we want to construct. So what's been pre present for us in the, in the day by day, not only at the COP, yeah, yeah. it's the so-called transitions, and especially energy transitions. But then what we've been asking and what we've been dialoguing with different groups, but also with communities who took this decision. Yeah. And yeah. why are we discussing only energy, but not discussing the system itself? The, the solution for the climate crisis, it needs to be much, much more broader than just the issue of energy. energy. Of course, when we, we get a broader picture of the challenge that we had, the system, the economical system that is intensive in production and consumption and the standards of life of certain regions of the world, especially connected to the global north, we will think differently. Of course, energy still will be an issue, but not, as I'm saying here every time, not the issue, and, but especially because the solutions are being proposed by, especially by, by the, the, the economical groups, the corporations, and the governments who put us in this situation, you know? And many times, it's just a change of technology. And who controls the technologies? The same ones who caused the impacts that are taking us into that situation. Mm -hmm. And that's a... a a, com a complex discussion. I give an example from a meeting I just left. Yes. Someone was in charge to talk about carbon credit. And he, carbon credit, I think everybody knows what means. Maybe you can explain it. Uh, I'm not very sure if all of you know carbon credit, but we can ask yes. what is carbon credit? Okay. Carbon credit is a, 
it's one type of solution that came from an idea that nature uh, accomplishes for us some services, okay? We would say those services, for which name services came from economists, you know, from a perspective of making money, uh, this service should be, let's say, uh, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis means forests get the sequestrate, we say, get the carbon and give us oxygen. And then we're going to put a price. You know, we are able to calculate for, I don't know, how many hectares of, of, of forest can be natural forest or planted forest, which means plantations of tree. And, and then I will pay because I know how many tons of carbon will be there. All right, I will pay, I will give to the indigenous peoples or the traditional communities who are there, part of it. Everything is based on monetize, monetize, yeah. you know, commodification of, of everything. Including nature. Yes. And then, which is the discussion? And, and why they do it? Because they need, to discuss, as they are discussing here, their commitments in terms of emissions, voluntary commitments, the countries do. This is going to be the level of the emissions. We're going to reduce the emissions. And then guess what happened? Let's see you from a country that the emissions are low, but there are a lot of forests. Okay, we're going to make a deal here. You know, I will buy those credits from you you know, and I will sell on the market for companies or for governments to keep the level. So this is a trick, cynical trick, to keep the things as a good business. So this mentality, this is the same mentality that made us and put us in this situation. Nature is not a capital. Nature is not only resource. Nature is life. Now the capitalism is able to, uh, and I think this go beyond the frontier. We, we are used to, to see the capital holding, accumulating the material part of the planet. Now, no. I will gonna give you a, a more, maybe a more examples are always reduce the thing, but that's not like your kidney that filtrates your, your, your blood. I would consider this as a service from your nature body. We have to pay for it, please. Yeah. Is there any so sense? Is, so, yeah, so, yeah. And, and what I was saying in the last meeting, I just left and then, and then I finished. The guy who presented for one person, for the, the, the problems of the carbon credit can just talk about money. In Europe, it's eight euros a ton in Africa, three euros a ton. But we don't we don't discuss anymore the conception that is behind this. And who's gonna win? Energy transition the same. Yeah. To maintain the consumption of energy and the standards of life from some parts of the world. And then they'll have to capture, to storage, and to distribute the energy technologies that need more money. Mining and mining, know what is it? Impacts, environmental impacts, human rights violation, and even criminal groups. Thanks, thanks a lot. I think it's very uh, uh, how to say it becomes our common concerns. You know how the system has been built in a certain way to serve certain way of living or certain thinking, certain mm -hmm. ideology. That finally, as you said, there's no real dialogue with those who are really affected. So now I'm jumping to a slightly different subject, which is very important. It's uh, at, at, at our heart as well about the loss and damage, you know. And uh, Elena has been uh, working on this of loss and damage for quite a long time. And uh, jointly, we are uh, doing a research uh, study regarding the non-economic loss and damage. And loss and damage is, uh, is also a big uh, subject being discussed now. Uh, there are different mechanisms uh, uh, in terms of loss and damage, but at the same time, uh, I still remember some of the uh, state. They say like there is a this mechanism, that mechanism, but 
my situation center ground is still the same you know there's no uh, i lost my land i lost my culture i lost my attempt not my identity but i lost the uh, how to say the point of reverence of my uh, community etc so what is this non economic loss and damage and why it's important elena thank you Woody, for this question uh, as you said we were conducting a research uh, trying to collect all the views from different faiths and different uh, regions and including youth and women so on the non-economic losses and damage, no, because uh, we are not just uh, losing infrastructure, but we are losing, as you said, uh, cohesion, uh, cultural uh, heritage, uh, land, ancestral land, um, identity, you no. Know? So many things that we need to take into account. How we can bring this into this discussion? Because now the discussion is about the economic losses, you no. Know? Um, uh, during the the beginning of this uh, this COP. So um, the idea, ideally, we need to have uh, three pillars in the NCQG, that is the uh, new, is collective, <laughs> new collective quantified goal on climate finances. So uh, this uh, was uh, mainly focused on adaptation and mitigation, but not, not on loss and damage. And what uh, was decided at COP last year is to have a loss and damage fund but only in a voluntary basis. So it's not part of the climate finance itself. So what we are saying here as a, as a, as a civil society is that we, have, we need to have a third pillar into the discussions. Otherwise, we cannot continue having this loss and damage fund on a voluntary basis. So we were discussing this also um, with the other groups that it is important that um, uh, we have this as a third pillar, so it's part of the whole package. You know? And during this week, just uh, there, there was a, a COP29 uh, uh, press uh, conference about the loss yes. of damage. And we expected, we had a lot of expectation, no? and we expected that there will be more pledges and there will be more news, but we, we just received one more pledge that is uh, 18 million uh, US dollars uh, from Sweden. That is nothing for. It's really nothing. Yeah, it was a kind of a joke for us, yes, wasn't it? Sometimes it's ridiculous, no? Last year, if you remember, Canada provided uh, pledge eleven uh, Canadian US dollar. That is like nine uh, millions of US dollars. US dollar. So it's it's uh, it's it's not what is needed, no? Um, and also they said that the funds will be ready to these form funds next year. But now there is no clarity about the process. Uh, what will be the process to submit proposal, for example, or how uh, um, local communities can access to this phone? So yeah. there is no yeah. clarity. Yeah. And we said that uh, there is a lot of lack of transparency when we are discussing uh, causes and damages. Um, and it's, it's war when we discuss non-economic losses and damages because uh, there is no definition within the UNFCCC, yes. the yeah. United Nations Framework for Convention on Climate Change, about what is the meaning of non-economic losses and damages. So that's why also we uh, we did this research, trying to contribute to this discussion at the global level, because I feel like when we talk about non-economic losses and damages, we are focusing really on the people needs. Mm. Also, and this is what... Uh, most of our organizations are doing when when uh, we support people on the ground no we are looking on the needs no? and maybe i can share very very uh, quickly some of the Finding. considerations that we need to yeah. take into account when we are talking about non-economic losses and damages so one is the community cohesion and identity no because uh, because of that cultural and religious practices that are central to the identity of many communities are being disrupted you no know, because of, of the climate change impact uh, many communities are uh, prevented from practicing their traditional rituals uh, that express this gratitude with the nature you no know? now they are feeling that the nature is harming them also, yeah that's very this true this is this uh, is yeah. very important to take into account uh, secondly, loss of territory, land, and ancestral land, as you said. So, and also when we are talking about this, there is a um, uh, a lot of people that will be uh, internally displaced 
or uh, forced to migrate, and they will settle in in a completely different environment. You know, for example, people who live in the coastal area will uh, settle in or move inland. Mm -hmm. So the uh, how, what happened with the with the with the livelihoods? You know, they need to adapt to a new, totally new environment. Another essential consideration is the interconnectedness with nature. For many religions and faith traditions, nature and humanity are seen as equals. No? And there are some uh, sense of there is harmonious relationship between them. So, but uh, because of this weather, extreme weather event, nature now is seen as a, as a suffering, no? because they are uh, provoking disasters. Also, how can deal with that? No? And also, uh, this can uh, let us to um, the thinking of we are losing our faith. Yes. You know? yeah, we are yeah. losing our hope. We are losing our plan of life. You no. Know? So there are many considerations that we need to take into account. Uh, talking about non-economic losses and damages. One more that I think also was mentioning here is this growing phenomenon among young adults, but also among all of us on, on climate anxiety or eco anxiety. You no, know? so I think this is something that. Um, it's, it's uh, really related to non-economic losses and damages, and we cannot ignore this uh, in this discussion, no? because it's, it's the way we are. No? So uh, I think um, it, it, this is something that uh, we, need, we continue need to highlight in, in different discussions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Don't worry, the study is going to be published very soon, so you will receive it. We will put it in the website of the Dominicans, of Lutheran, mm -hmm. of the Franciscans, and I will invite you to read it. It's not going to be a very long document, by the way, but it's very interesting because we did a research uh, with the study together. Rodrigo was interviewed. There were some representatives coming from our organizations. So it is based on the real experience of people on the ground. You know, So that's, very, that's why it's interesting. And as a faith-based communities, we also have something to say because uh, it's uh, COP is not is not uh, about the big decisions, big uh, technical discussions, but it's also about the life of the people. So that's why it's very important. Uh, there was uh, a, there there was a questions coming from uh, uh, the people who are listening. A simple question: is, How does the day here looks like? So that can be interesting, no? Like I can maybe go to you because you you with the two uh, partners coming from uh, the Philippines. How is the day? Uh, here, because mm -hmm. uh, our colleagues there, they are not here, but they would like to know. So, how is the day? Mm -hmm. A little bit of a jungle, <laughs> a circus, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of people around, um, a lot of media coverage also. So, um, uh, it's interesting to see the perspective of the different uh, journalists also uh, online. But I think um, uh, for us, um, I would say it's very uh, insightful and but sometimes a little bit overwhelming and a bit frustrating also when we see um, some of those uh, very big famous celebrities coming such as uh, like? uh, uh, Ronaldinho, Ronaldinho. Uh, all, uh, celebrity from Brazil right coming in in a private jet today and uh, sponsored the by uh, probably Socar is that Socar yeah. the, the... Socar is the biggest uh, yeah. oil company from this country so one may feel a little bit disappointed and um yes uh, yeah. frustrated but yeah. apart from that it's an interesting experience yeah, exactly. <laughs> and 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 because we talk about heavy things as well no but uh when when you are here what that excites you the most i think in my case for example having this uh, uh, opportunity to connect to each other with different faiths and different mm -hmm. traditions and discover that at the end we have the same goal so this is also an opportunity to collaborate better no we yeah. had many meetings how can we um, collaborate for the next cop because we feel like the civil society is more strong in brazil than here, <laughs> because here you cannot see civil society organizations. So I I I I am really interested in that. And uh, I have a bit, bit more difficult questions coming from uh, the participant. Thank you for the critical questions, by the way, because US now has different government coming. Argentina just withdraw from COP. So guys, Argentina participated in COP, but the decision taken by the government yesterday was to withdraw Argentina from the negotiation. 
And then Papua New Guinea, because some of us are coming from that region, doesn't send any delegation here as well because of different reasons. And as you know, that some of the key uh, leaders or keyword leaders like Modi from India or some of the or Chinese uh, president, they're not here. So what is your view on that? Rodrigo? Well, it puts on our hands, puts on people's organizations and the different uh, perspectives and the, the real diversity. Because sometimes when, when withdrawal cause a, a big problem, but there are some countries they don't withdraw and they cause problem the same. So uh, I think uh, what Ellen said, it's, it, it's, it, it's, a, it, it's important. We can be walking back and forth here, many activities happening, but it's, it's, it's an opportunity. And that's why the People Summit in COP30, can, it's a, it will be a space where civil society, different organizations, and indigenous people, traditional communities can get together and, and check among us. And, 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 and it's a space for our agreements. I think the big challenge is to build the civil society agenda and not only follow the UN agenda for COP, because this is compromised with some interests. It doesn't mean we, we, we're going to withdraw from, 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 from COPs, but counter COP, people summits are special places where we can move and push the countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks for that. And there was also one of the other questions here. Uh, Elena, uh, question for you and also for you, Igor. Uh, what do the people and the grassroots can do to support our work? I think they can do a lot because um, I don't want to 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 say that we are co focused, no? Yeah, because yeah. every decision that uh, that uh, governments will take here need to implement at the local level at the end, and I think it's better to have. Um, information from the local level to take decision here and not on the other uh, on the other side. No, so people can do a lot uh, during the next period of the new NDCs. So and the national NDCs, the national country con determined contributions. So there will be a process at the national level, and there are many windows to influence uh, the government decisions. No, also I think the national adaptation plans that uh, was also a decision that uh, the uh, parties uh, took last year that every country should have a national adaptation plan, and you in your own country also should push your your national government to go through this process, no? And if you can see, uh, you can Google on the websites, uh, the NDCs and the NAPs, there, there are uh, suggest, um, suggestions on how to do the, this process. And all of them includes that civil society organizations should be part of this process. So you have an opportunity to contribute from the ground. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, Igor? No, yeah, just to add in the reflection, uh, I would say that Sometimes when we are from the outside of this kind of uh, uh, meetings and, and, and international, uh, uh, international uh, bodies and we talk about governments and so on, it seems really complex. Mm. Even if for those who are Even for us, engaged, sometimes, you know, sometimes yeah. it's, it's, it's really complex. But uh, we understand and I would say that it's important even if we don't understand the mechanisms, we know what's happening. So we know that the, the, we know about climate change. We are facing this in, in different countries. We already know what happened in, Brazil, in South of Brazil this year, and now uh, in Europe, in Spain, and other uh, uh, regions in other countries. So it's important, even if we, we don't understand the technical approach, it's important to be uh, engaged on this topic. So we know that, the governments and the political leaders will not move forward if uh, the civil society doesn't uh, pressure or does organize uh, their, their selves. So I would say this, uh, pay attention on this or be engaged in a Catholic perspective. Let's mobilize our communities to take action, to lead as example, but at the same time to, to, do, to, do the, to, to, to be the voices of those who are voiceless. So I think it's a, it's a kind of part of our mission. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for the concrete one. Don't just be yeah. the voice of the voiceless. Don't stay in the no? Yeah. Don't, it's about our life. 
Yeah. It's about our life. It's about our planet. It's about our home, our common home that we need to keep it. Because if we don't keep our common home, then where else? No, I mean, Mars. we are not going to go to Mars or to the moon or whatever. Be realistic. It's common home. It's our responsibility. So it's very important. So uh, now the next question that comes, because I'm also checking my mobile phone to see uh, about the questions. Uh, the next question is that uh, if, we, if, if uh, people ask who are the major players, in this cop, you just mentioned that. <laughs> you know, would say yeah. corporation. <laughs> <laughs> Who are the major players? In fact, I mean, we have states for sure. Uh, we have civil society, and you rightly said that you know the agenda has been set by state, but it's not our agenda. But who else? Private sector is it also a uh, uh, an actor here? I think private sector it's an actor here because we see them after cop acting with the governments with the European Union and. Uh, and other economical blocks, you know? So, and that's why as time passes, um, COP is more, I used to say, somehow a place for business. The governor of my state, Minas Gerais from Brazil is here. He has no commitment with his environment or anything. When, when he was interviewed for, for the press in Brazil, they said, I'm there to do business for our state. He said that? Yeah. Publicly? Publicly. Publicly. So it's an opportunity, you know? And and when you see the government speeches, it involves investments, it involves, involves uh, 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 the private sector. If you go back to the energy transition, both are together, governments and private sector proposing. And of course, the mining sector you, you was put on the forefront in terms of the solution. You can imagine what does it mean. And what are the investments in the world nowadays in the so-called green economy? It's an, a type of ideology that demands a lot of faith that through a green capitalism, we're going to change. Yeah, yeah. But we'll keep the hope. We'll keep the hope because... The Despite all the difficulties, I think uh, we are here because we take the responsibility and we need also to keep the hope that, yes, we can do something, no? I think we struggle, not because only because we, we're going to win or tomorrow, et cetera, because this is the way. Because, because we, we are coming from, uh, from, from, from the, the difficulties, the, the struggles that are happening, it's not because we are better or not. But we believe yes, yes, in, yes. in the possibility of this planet to still be able to support life. So that's why I now come to you, Lawrence, because uh, Dominican for Justice and Peace has published uh, a book which is very interesting. Uh, can you explain why this book is very important and why it's important for you to invest in the education? No, because I think this is also one of the things that uh, we need to keep in in mind that uh, education is important. Uh, uh, in uh, trying to uh, address the challenges or the, the negative impact of climate change. Can you explain a little bit on that direction? Yes, I think the approach is really to uh, educate and raise awareness among the younger generations. Uh, this project is uh, focusing on the Philippines because it's a pilot project, but the idea is to export this approach and the handbook that we just published uh, to other countries. Uh, but really the, the stance is that the young generations are our future leaders, uh, the future negotiators at the COP, and uh, they need to be uh, prepared to this new climate reality. And they need to also be empowered by uh, the teachers, by the school community to be able to promote human rights while addressing climate change. I think Padillo made it very clear that uh, there are some uh, climate solutions uh, that are proposed uh, within uh, the UN uh, framework and that those solutions are actually violating the rights of the people uh, and so in with this handbook we really hope that the students will not only be able to understand what is climate change and but to really be able to understand that this impacts their life and that the state is accountable for the violation of the human rights and um, so um, uh, we hope that by educating the students uh, this will be also cascaded within their families and in their own 
community and um, so we've launched it in July. Uh, we hope to mainstream this approach throughout the whole of the Philippines. Um, and uh, hopefully by next year, we would like to export it to Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, Don't forget to check also in the websites of Dominican yes, for thanks. Justice and Peace. And then you'll find uh, that public publication that might also inspire you in your own uh, reality. Uh, now there's uh, another question. Now I put it back to you, uh, Elena. Who are, uh, uh, because we are talking about the actors. Huh? We are talking about the U.S. is not here. Achidina withdrew. Uh, the president of India or China, they're not coming here, etc. But what is the role of small states like the Pacific, the Caribbean? What are the roles of these uh, states that are very vulnerable uh, uh, because of the climate change? Uh, uh, what do you think? I think that they are pushing on the agenda you know, to have, for example, the climate finances we need to support vulnerable people, but because uh, they are not have the power here, so it's difficult for them also to achieve the results, but they are the ones who propose uh, um, very ambitious uh, targets, you know, not only on the climate finances, but also on the NDCs that we really have ambitious NDCs to keep global warming to 1.5 Celsius degrees. So they are also coming with some ideas, and I think uh, great ideas to the form of the loss and damage. You know? And they are also, I think uh, they have the role to criticize you know, the, the most powerful or the developed countries, I must say. Thank you. Perhaps now uh, in the last five, 10 minutes, uh, in the last three COPs, we have the COPs in the so-called oil producing country. So the, next year we will have COP in Brazil with the dynamic civil society uh, reality in Brazil. There are so much hope. There are so much hope. Uh, but I would like also to know from you, what do you expect from COP30 in Brazil? Maybe we can start from, from non-Brazilian first. Eh? <laughs> so we will start from uh, Lohongs. Uh, well, as I said earlier, our hope is really to be able to um, engage uh, the Dominican family in Brazil, who are quite numerous and very active and engaged on justice and peace issues. So we really hope um, that this COP will also uh, be an incentive for them to be more aware about the climate change issues and why not developing uh, an approach with this handbook on climate change and human rights and to have maybe students in, the, in Brazil to uh, start using this now. Thank you very much. And for you, Elena? For me, so we also have a, a really strong church in Brazil, and also a church in Belen, a Lutheran church in Belen. We are in contact with them to organize our activities there. But I think in general, in Latin America and the Caribbean, there are a lot of good examples of adaptation, on loss and damage programming, on the interlinkages between climate change and migration, climate change and gender. I think it's an opportunity for us uh, to showcase you know, that there are good practices and uh, that these good practices can take at, a, at the COP. You know? So if we are talking about, for example, the wind, the water mechanism at the Santiago network, that is the, the, the body that will provide technical, technical support. Yeah. So we, we have a lot. To, to share with them also. I think it's an opportunity for us to do that. Thank you. And now, because Igor and uh, Rodrigo, they are Brazilians, no? coming from the real, uh, the reality in Brazil. So what do you expect? Yeah, I expect that COP30 will be COP of people. So as we are discussing about the stakeholders, people, you know, the different actors and COP, we have the private sector, we have the states, and we have the people. But sometimes in COPs in some countries, people are not allowed to join or to, to be at least present in the place. So I would say that we need to organize ourselves. We need to be together, to be a power, to be a stakeholder. And I believe that COP30 in Belém will be a place that we can mobilize our communities and people to be together and to fight against climate change. It sounds very convincing. Instead of a finance COP, it's going to be mm -hmm. people's COP. No, we reclaim back the space. We hope. We hope. <laughs> we will do that. And what do you think, Rodrigo? Well, other than what he said, that I agree, because a COP, well, I would say it's a COP after some countries, oil countries, and countries with no commitment, but at least it will be in the Amazon region. So this is one aspect that is important. 
I think the presence of indigenous communities, indigenous peoples, and traditional communities around the country. For us, in terms of church, it's an important year, 10 years of Laudato uh, Si, 800 years of the Canticle of the Creatures that inspired Pope Francis in terms of Laudato Si, but also Jubilee year, exactly. and of a hope. Mm -hmm. And so we need to, this is the word that we need to make happen. And, but, but also for us to prepare. I, I think it's going to be a momentum for us in the country. That we, we have something to face, of, of course, realistically, knowing the limits, but especially in the perspective of sharing the possibility. And maybe if we still believe that some hearts can be changed or structures can be changed, maybe the presence in a in a region like that, and in a city with it's a it's a big city, but with a lot of uh, social and environmental problems, also uh, can can give a different uh, flavor and, and possibilities. But what we need to do is after COP thirty, it's a continuous yes. process of summits because we don't have any more global gatherings that we can start showing and to dispute the agendas. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Maybe just to, to close a little bit, uh, there's also a question on what will be, uh, what the second will second week will look like. No? Uh, uh, when I attended some of the discussions today, there there is a certain feelings that the negotiation is very slow. People are trying to buy times, etc. So the second week will be very crucial because the second week will be the week in which some of the negotiation has to be uh, concluded, has to be uh, uh, wrapped up, like the questions of NCQG, uh, which is a big elephant in the room. Uh, it's, it's, the negotiation is very slow. We don't know whether we will be very ambitious or not uh, because that will be a kind of the landmark that they expect. We don't know yet. So far, the first week is still very slow. Piano, piano. So it's very slow. And there is a, a difficult, a, uh, several challenges, etc. So that's going to accelerate, I think, in the coming uh, next week. The, uh, the same with the issue of loss and damage, and the issue of uh, um, uh, adaptation as well, and some other issues. So that will be uh, uh, the moment in which the real negotiation will take place. Uh, and uh, some of us will not be there. Uh, I think the four of us will not be there. You will still be here. So surely we will try to, in our next climate talk that will take this next week, I will try to negotiate so that uh, Elena can also be online with us so that she can provide us with the, uh, what is it, with the uh, updates, etc. But uh, we are talking about different publications, but I think uh, we as uh, Franciscans, the issue of environment is really at, at, at our heart. We've been working a lot on that issue and we will continue to work on that issue. And uh, we just published uh, a, a guidebook also regarding the right to healthy environment. And it is in two languages, in English and in Spanish. So I hope uh, you can also use that uh, uh, guidebook uh, regarding the right to have the environment for your community or for your school or for your university, just visit our website and then you'll find it there. So uh, I would like uh, to thank to each of you, Elena, Igor, Rodrigo, and uh, Lohong for your time. Uh, everyone is exhausted, to be very honest, because the day is very long. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's very, very intense day. And just to make... Uh, to make it a bit more difficult is that there is a reception not too far from here. So we can smell the food, we can smell the wine. We don't know whether we have the access to that reception or not, but at least we can smell it. We'll <laughs> we will try because we are crafting. So uh, that, 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 that's, that, that's how it, it, it is in, 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 in the COP. So thank you very much once again. And then uh, don't forget for you all to be part of our discussion next week so that you can uh, also get the updates coming uh, from uh, COP directly. So thanks and have a good day and have a good continuations. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye, colleagues.